I have been asked to speak on joy, on biblical joy, and as probably every one of you in this room knows, that the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, and then what's rest? Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, self-control, right? And so we know from God's Word that joy should be a byproduct of every woman in this room who has been born of God. In other words, you've bowed the knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You just don't believe uh, in your heart or in your head, I should say, that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried. He rose again according to the scriptures on the third day, and he's coming to judge the living and the dead. Again, we know that, right? Someday, sooner than later, hopefully, right? We can know those facts intellectually. I knew those facts growing up in a minister's home, even being married to a minister, but it never took root in my heart until I was 30 when I bowed the knee, saw myself as a sinner, and repented of my sins and mourned and wept over my sins, and that's when my life changed. That's when my my husband were here today. He would tell you that's when Susan's life changed, and one of the things that was never in my life was joy. Um, In fact, often people would say, why you are so unhappy? Why are you unhappy? Well, I didn't have the joy of the Lord. And I remember one time specifically after the Lord saved me, I was uh, pumping gas at the gas station and I had to go in to pay. And the guy behind the counter, he said, he said, boy, you sure are happy. What's the key? Well, what's the key, right? The joy of the Lord. That's the key. So I know that joy is sometimes very challenging, especially in the culture we live in, the world we live in, which has gone crazy. It's perverted. Uh, it's wicked. It's becoming more wicked every day. But sometimes joy is hard in the, even in the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, sometimes the church today looks like a theater instead of the church where God is worshiped. And so uh, sometimes there's a, a lack of biblical teaching uh, from God's word. And so we're not equipped and we haven't been nurtured. Our spiritual arms and muscles have not been nurtured in the things of Christ. But we are going to talk about joy. And I have two times this morning to speak to you on this issue. And so some of you this morning may have lost your joy. And there are many reasons why. One of them, one of the reasons I find that women often lose their joy is because of wrong thinking. I call it stinking thinking, which leads to wrong speech. The Bible says out of the heart, the mouth what? Speaks. So ladies, whatever is in your heart is coming out of your mouth. My husband used to say, it's not what you think you are. It's what you think you are. And so what we think determines how we speak. And so some of you in this room have gotten into a sinful habit of murmuring, complaining, and even arguing. And so we're going to look at that first thing this morning. And I'm going to give you uh, some motivations to put that off along with some hopefully some helpful tips at the end. And then secondly, another reason some in this room have lost their joy is because of being discontent. There's people in your life that rub you the wrong way, and so you're not happy, you're not content. Maybe it's in your marriage, maybe it's with your kids, maybe it's with your coworkers, maybe it's with the lady sitting next to you, I hope not, but uh, maybe she's rubbing you the wrong way, and so you're discontent. Uh, So sometimes people, people rob us of our joy. Circumstances, circumstances can cause us to be discontent. I know when my husband passed away a year and a half ago, I'd never been a widow. And uh, so that was, you know, the first year was a little challenging. And I had to learn to be content as a widow. And so sometimes circumstances of life don't go perhaps the way we desire. And so we lose our joy. And so I'm going to give you four keys to contentment. And so if you would, for our first session, you do have outlined there before you uh, in the notes, we're going to be looking at the danger of murmuring. And we're going to be looking at just a few verses in Philippians 2, 14 through 18. And I know we have prayed already, but you can never pray enough, right? So let's pray and we will begin our first session together. Our Father in heaven, we are eternally grateful for your mercy. As our sister has already said, thanking you for transferring us out of darkness into light, transferring us from that kingdom of slavery to sin to 
the beautiful kingdom of being a slave to righteousness. Father, I thank you for saving us. I thank you for giving us purpose of life. Thank you for the joy that it is to be called your daughter. Thank you that we have the hope of heaven that is before us. We do not know when we will enter into that eternal place, but Lord, I pray in the meantime, while we are here, that our lives would be filled with joy, Lord, with contentment, with a, a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that everyone looking in to our life would get a glimpse of what Jesus looks like, Lord. I pray that you would speak to each one of our hearts this morning. I pray, Father, for these women, if they have lost joy, I pray that through the study of your word, looking intently into the mirror of God's word this morning, that there would be repentance that would take place. Father, that the joy of the Lord would return. Perhaps they're like David. Maybe they, they've been involved in sin and they've not confessed it and the bones that have been broken could rejoice again after confession and repentance. Lord, I don't know what each need is, but you do. And so, Father, I pray that you would meet each one of us in the way that your dear spirit would like to. May he be free to roam our hearts with comfort or conviction or teaching us something we haven't seen before. Whatever the work he wants to do, may we have hearts that are pliable. I pray this in your son Jesus' precious name, my Lord. Amen. Well... Benjamin Franklin once said, any fool can criticize, condemn, and complain, and most fools do. <laughs> Jesus Christ says through his word in Philippians 2, 14 through 18, if you would look there, do all things without murmuring and complaining that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ Jesus, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I'm be offered as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, be glad and rejoice with me. Now you have a little outline there. We're gonna look at three things. First of all, the command not to murmur. Secondly, motivations not to murmur. I'm gonna give you five of them. Three of them have to do with your testimony. One of them has to do with what the Lord sees, your heart. And the last one has to do with your leadership. But don't worry, I'll go over that. And then thirdly, the model of Paul in not murmuring. So let's look first of all, the command to not murmur. Paul writes in this epistle, do everything without murmuring. And ladies, it's important. The order of the Greek here is important because it places emphasis on everything that we as a Christian does, everything. In fact, the present tense of the verb do suggests this command is to be done continually. We're to do all things, all times without murmuring. In fact, the word all means just that, all, the totality. So Paul tells us how we do all things continually. He says, without complaining and disputing. Now, what does this mean? Well, the word complaining, your translation might say murmuring, means to complain or grumble. And the translation of the word reflects a bad tone using a low tone of voice. So you have a bad attitude and a low tone of voice, like, are you kidding me? <laughs> My plane back to Oklahoma is delayed again? This happens to us a lot. Or in California, I knew I'd, there's a reason my daughter and I were here since Tuesday spending some mother-daughter time together. And uh, we were heading down to Santa Clarita. She wanted to see a friend, I wanted to see a friend. And we each have one friend, it's great. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, we were heading down there and I said, Cindy, this is why I don't want to move back to California, that traffic. So maybe it's that. You're mumbling, traffic is backed up again. Or when my children were growing up, there was a certain book they loved me to read to them all the time. Mommy, would you read this book? 
And under my breath, I'm saying, I've read this book for the zillionth time. I don't want to read this book anymore. I'm sick of this book. I, you know, or maybe you work and your employer wants you to stay late. And you're saying in your heart again, he wants me to stay late again. Or you have to go to your in-laws for dinner again. And so, you know, or this one, this would be me when I was married. Uh, often I'm on my way to teach our ladies Bible study. And just as I was getting ready to head out the door, my husband would say, hey, honey, on your way to the church, could you take my shirts to the dry cleaners? And under my breath, I'm going, he knows I have to be there a certain time. He's going to return So, see, we all do it, right? We're all sinners. We all do that. We complain under our breath. It's interesting, this word is used in Acts 6.1. It's the first usage of it. It says in those days when the numbers of the discipling, disciples were multiplying, there was a murmuring, a complaining by the Hebrews against the Hellenists because the widows were neglected in the daily menstruation. It's interesting, the first mentioning here in Acts of murmuring had to do with money. <laughs> Nothing new under the sun, right? Paul also uses the same Greek word when talking about the speech of false teachers. So this is a big red flag because ladies, I don't want the speech of a false teacher. Do you? Someone who doesn't really say what he believes in his heart. Peter says, or Paul says in this, or excuse me, Paul says in Jude 16, or Jude says in Jude 16, these are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust, and their mouth speak great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. That's what false teachers do. They speak great swelling words, hoping to gain an audience. They also grumble. They complain. Now, the meaning of the word here, murmuring, complaining, refers back to a story. Remember, Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. He's in prison. This is one of the prison epistles. And so he's writing to the church there at Philippi. This is a church that he dearly loved. They loved him. And so most of the people sitting there listening to this letter be read at the synagogue from Paul in prison, most of them, especially if they were 12 years or older, uh, they would have the first five books of Moses memorized, as most Jewish boys memorized the first five books of Moses by the time they were 12 years of age. And so they would, when he says, you know, do all things without murmuring and complaining, their minds would think back to what? The, the Israelites. Remember how many times they murmured and complained? They didn't like the manna. And so they murmured and complained. And what did God say? Okay, I'll give you some meat. And then so, so much so it started coming out their noses. I mean, that sounds really gross, doesn't it? And so, I mean, they were murmuring and complaining about everything. And so even Miriam and Aaron, remember they complained about Moses because he married an Ethiopian uh, woman. And so they, they were mum murmurers. And so they would be very familiar here with what he's talking about. And I wanna look back, not at that story, but I want us to look at the Pauline uh, rehearsal of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So if you would turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul is warning the church at Corinth about this dangerous sin of murmuring and complaining. Notice what he writes. Moreover, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted and do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Now look at verse 10, nor complain. As some of them complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition on whom the end of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has taken you, but such is common to man. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape. 
And then he says, therefore, my beloved, flee idolatry, flee it. You know what Paul is telling the church at Corinth here? All the Israelites had the same privilege. They all got to pass through the Red Sea. They all ate that same spiritual food. They drank of the rock, which was Christ. And yet it wasn't enough. Christ was not enough for them. So they murmured, they complained, they lusted after things that were not theirs. And Paul says, God was not well pleased with them. Ladies, we have so many advantages. Even though the United States of America is going down the tubes pretty quickly, we still live in a country where we can do this. Do you know how many places in third world countries women women could not gather together and study the Bible without fear of being killed? Uh, A girl in India, I read about that uh, she became a Christian. Her husband dropped her off at her parents' house for dinner and her parents poisoned her food and killed her because of just becoming a Christian. We have so many advantages. We have the word of God. We can listen and drink from the rock that the Israelites did. But for many of us, it's not enough. Christ is not enough. And so we murmur and we complain about what we don't have and we lust for things that are not ours to have and God is not pleased. And yet Paul says to the church at Corinth, there is a way of escape. God has made a escape hatch for us. And he says, what is the escape hatch? Flee it, (laughs) flee idolatry. And ladies, the escape for murmuring, complaining is you need to be content. We'll talk about that in the next lesson. So you have to wait for that. There is a way, we are to flee that. Well, Paul mentions another form of our speech we need to put off. Notice what he says, disputing, disputing. That means arguing. It reflects a a legal connotation of disputing, and it may refer to uh, going to court to settle differences. This describes a person that's always disagreeing with someone. Have you ever met someone like that? They just want to disagree to disagree. Those people are hard to be around, aren't they? In fact, I kind of avoid them. (laughs) They just wanna argue. I meet a lot of them on social media and they just wanna argue with me about everything. No, no wonder people that argue do not have the joy of the Lord. Ladies, how can we possibly have joy if we're always murmuring, always arguing? Someone said this, murmuring Christians are seldom of any use to the cause of Christ. If only God's children would stop their whisperings about this one or that one, about this policy or that policy. Beware of the grumbling undertone. Do not join the devil's crowd by engaging your energies in stirring up strife. And ladies, I would lovingly say to you as an older woman, I don't know if I'm the oldest one here, but I am an older woman, That includes what you post on social media, the arguing, the bickering. You know, my husband used to say, you're not gonna get a king's ex on judgment day for what you post on social media. You're still gonna be accountable for that. And some of what goes on social media among God's children is awful. It's awful. The bickering, the arguing, the slander, the hurtful tones. Ladies, that's not acceptable. We should not be involved in that. Remember the Bible says, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle. We're to be gentle. For those that are ensnared by the devil, we're to be gentle with them. You're not gonna win anybody by arguing and bickering with them. In fact, it's not by chance that Paul begins chapter two with these words in Philippians chapter two. If there's any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the spirit, Fulfill my joy. You want to make me happy, Paul says? (laughs) Be like-minded. Have the same love. Be united. And ladies, it doesn't mean that we aren't divided over doctrine. We are. And there are things that we stand, we contend for the faith. We stand fast on some things. But honestly, there's just some things among Christendom that aren't really worth bickering and arguing about, right? I remember during COVID, my husband used to say, you know, you can have really strong opinions about the vaccine. You can have strong opinions about the mask and you can even try to persuade your friend. 
But what you cannot do is allow it to fray relationships. And ladies, the things that we get caught up in sometimes are dishonoring to the Lord. It blasphemes his name. Well, Paul says we are to put off all arguing, all complaining. So ladies, this means if someone starts an argument with you, don't participate in it. Don't revile back. It says when Jesus was reviled, he didn't revile back. When he was threatened, he didn't threaten back. He committed himself to the one who judges righteously. I know before I became a believer, I had a terrible temper. I would say, ask my husband, but you can't. (laughs) So you get to glory and then you can ask him. But uh, I would be upset about something and he would say, Susan, I'm not gonna talk to you till you calm down. Well, that just made me more angry, you know? (laughs) But uh, he was a very wise man. He knew that that didn't accomplish anything. Arguing and bickering do not accomplish anything. Ladies, again, I want to emphasize the three-letter word that Paul mentions here. All complaining, all arguing, all murmuring. This means we get out of the bed in the morning with no murmuring, and as you get older, it could be a little bit more challenging. (laughs) Ladies, teach your kids to go to bed without murmuring. When you say, it's time to go to bed, they should say, yes, mom. There should be no murmuring. Elizabeth Elliot said we should not only discipline for disobedience, but even for the attitude, right? You wanna teach your children to have a good attitude. It means you have a headache, a cold, the flu, without complaining. It means you go to that restaurant that you don't really wanna go to without murmuring. I know you guys are just probably like I was. Doug would say, where do you wanna go eat? I don't care. Where do you want to go eat? I don't care. Where do you want to get? And then he made something. He goes, I go, I don't like that place. <laughs> he said, you just said you didn't care, you know? So we do care, right? Speak, that's when we need to speak the truth in love, right? It means you cook meals, clean house, run errands, grocery shop, everything else without murmuring. John MacArthur once sent this. My husband, or not my husband, my son sent this to me. It was a quote by John MacArthur. He says, now, if you're in Hiroshima and it's 1945, you have a problem worthy of considerable concern, but just because you lost out on a promotion or a business deal, just because your child announced last week she hates her room, just because the bank notified you this morning that you're overdrawn, I'm sure you can find a way to survive. Calm down, review the situation, think it through. I hear all about midlife crisis. Do you know there are nations in the world that don't even have midlife crisis because they don't live that long? Some people aren't bothered by such things at all. There are parts of the world where the average lifespan is 37 years, and men and women are spared the distressing reality of a 40th birthday. Some people complain about grocery bills. More than 10,000 people die of starvation every day and you're complaining about grocery bills? Millions more suffer from malnutrition. Some people say they complain about the high cost of rent. Well, maybe you'd rather be a pavement dweller in Calcutta. They don't pay rent. They're born, they live, and they die on the pavement. The only thing they have to worry about is to find a rag they can put under their head when they go to sleep. You see? While these kinds of horrors go on around the world in a sort of a normal accepted pace, we throw tenter tantrums because we get seated at a poorly located table in a fancy restaurant, or we're frustrated because we can't lose 10 pounds, or we gripe about our monthly debts. You've got problems relative to what? But you see, it's the mood of the mob to complain. And then the idealistic fantasy oriented consumptive culture feeds the sin of discontent. How can we be discontent? Remember Lamentations 339, why should any mortal being or anyone offer complaint in view of his sins? What do we have to complain about? Nothing, right? when you think about that. Ladies, we are to put off all murmuring, all complaining. Maybe you're saying, okay, you've 
you're, I'm convicted. I get it. I get it. But give me some motivations. Okay. Paul will give you five motivations to put off murmuring and arguing. And as I mentioned, three of them have to do with your personal testimony before others. One of them has to do with what God sees in your heart. And lastly, your leadership that's going to give an account for you on the day of judgment. Look at verse 15. Here's motivations to not murmur. So that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So ladies, if you're taking notes, the first motivation for not murmuring is so that you will be blameless. Your testimony is at stake. In fact, the word blameless means one who cannot be caught and accused someone above reproach, and especially without fault before others. The second motivation for not complaining is to be harmless, to be harmless. This word means without any mix of deceit, someone who is sincere. Um, Let me say this, the blameless is what the world sees. We want to be blameless before others. That's one of the qualifications of an elder or deacon. They're to be above reproach. They're to have a good reputation towards those that are outside, those that are looking in. And so as people watch our life, we want to look, we want to be blameless. But the harmless has to do with what God sees. The blameless denotes the outward condition to the world, what they see. Harmless indicates the inward condition of our soul. This is what God sees. So ladies, you might be outwardly not murmuring, complaining, but you're doing it in your heart. And remember, everything is naked and open into the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The writer to the Hebrews says, he sees it all. He sees what our heart maybe is deceiving us about. In fact, the word harmless was a word that was used of wine, which had not been diluted or of metal that had not been weakened in any way. It's what God sees in our heart. Ladies, if we're not blameless, if we're not harmless when it comes to our speech, then we send a confusing message to the world. Why would anybody want to be a Christian if all they see in our lives is a woman who's always arguing and always complaining about everything. We look just like the world, right? I remember one time a, a, a lady told me, she said, if that lady's gonna be in heaven, I'd rather go to hell than spend eternity with her. That's a horrible indictment on that lady's testimony, right? That someone would rather go to hell than spend an eternity with you or I because of the way we're behaving. Ladies, we want to be blameless. We want to be harmless. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is to keep short accounts with God and with man, be a woman of the word, right? Be a woman of prayer, fight those life dominating sins in your life. Make sure you're using the spiritual armor that Paul mentions in Ephesians chapter six, that you're fighting the devil daily with the word of God, with righteousness. Ladies, guard your soul, feed your heart and your soul with the pure word of God. Well, the third motivation for not arguing and planning, and notice what Paul says, is so that you can show the world that you are children of God without fault. Now, this is a phrase that Paul is using to describe true Christians. Paul knew they were Christians. In fact, when he opens the epistle to the Philippians, he says to all the saints who are at Philippi. So he believes these people are, are Christians, just like I hope that every one of you in this room this morning is a believer. But Paul is saying this, okay, you say you're a saint, you say you're a child of God, now make sure that you are a child of God by showing forth a Christ-like attitude. Show the world. You say you have faith, now let's see it, right? Show and tell. Let the world see your attitude that is without blame, without defect, he says, in a world that is crooked and perverse. Well, motivation number four for no murmuring is, notice what he says, we are to shine as lights in the world. The word lights here refers to the heavenly body, the sun, the moon, the stars. What's he saying? He's saying our testimony with our speech, our mouth. 
should be as a light to a very, very dark world. They should look at us and that should be attractive to them. It should be comforting to them. I don't know if you've ever been in a very, very dark place. I have. I remember when our children were growing up, uh, we went to the Merrimack Caverns one time for a family vacation. Have anybody ever been to inside a dark cave? I'm the only one. Wow. You girls should all try it. It's creepy. So anyway, they take you inside this really, really dark cave and they turn out all the lights. And it is creepy. It reminds me of what Jude says, where false teachers are going to spend eternity in the blackness of darkness forever. You can't, I mean, it's creepy. And so you're standing there with your family. Doug and I were standing there with our two children. And boy, when they turn on that flashlight, it's like, oh, thank you. It's, it's very scary to be in that type of a dark place. But when the light is shown, there is comfort. And that's what Paul is saying. We can bring comfort and joy, consolation. Our words can have meaning to a very lost, dark world. But ladies, if your words are argumentative, if your words are full of complaining, that's not comforting to a lost world. That's repelling. Why would they want anything? It looks just like the world, right? looks just like them. In fact, I wonder how more effective we would be in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the lost if our words were kind, gracious, winsome, over being arguing, argumentative and complaining. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a lamp and put a bushel over it, right? And then he says, let your light so shine before men. Why? So they can see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Ladies, we want our lights to shine in a very, very dark world. Just as heavenly lights dispel earthly darkness, believers who shine as lights dispel spiritual and moral darkness. In fact, Paul goes on to say in verse 16, We're to hold fast the word of life. Hold fast means hold it firmly. The word of life is the gospel, which has life in itself. In fact, it was used in secular Greek as offering wine to a guest at a banquet. What's he saying? He's saying, you Philippian believers, hold out. Hold out this cup, not of murmuring and complaining. What good would it be if I said, hey, would you like this cup of murmuring and complaining? I'd be happy to give you one, you know. That's not comforting, right? But he says, hold it out, the gospel of life, by the way you talk, not by complaining and not by arguing. Well, we move on to the fifth motivation for not complaining. Paul says, so that I can rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run or labored in vain. So what's the fifth motivation for not murmuring, not complaining, not arguing? The fifth motivation is this, so that your leadership will rejoice in the day of Christ. You know what Paul is saying? As you live blamelessly in a lost world, when I stand before the Lord on that day, and he is going to stand before the Lord just like my husband's going to stand before the Lord, just like every shepherd that belongs to all you ladies wherever you go to church. Remember what Peter says. Remember, elders, you're going to stand before the chief shepherd someday, right? And the writer to the Hebrews says, obey them that have the rule of you. Why? They watch for your souls. They're going to give an account on that day. And then he goes on to say, let them do that with what? Joy and not with grief when they give an account for you. Because if it's with grief, the writer to the Hebrews says, that's going to be unprofitable for you. So when my husband stands before the Lord on judgment day and he gives account for Susan Joy Heck, I hope it's with, honey, hope it's with... uh, joy and not with grief, especially when it comes to my speech. So ladies, one day your leadership is going to stand before the Lord and give an account. And Paul says, I want to rejoice in the day of Christ when I stand before the Lord that I have not run or labored in vain. I don't want my labor for you to be in vain. Remember he told the the church at Galatia and the church at Corinth, he, he feared for them. He feared he'd labored in vain. My labor for you has been in vain. He even told the church at Corinth, he said, I stand in doubt of you guys. I don't even think you're saved. And so he, you know, he, 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 he kept on laboring, but for the church at Galatia, the church at Corinth, he felt it was in vain. And Paul says, I want to know the labor, the exhaustion I have pouring my life into you 
is not going to be in vain. So ladies, we turn from the five motivations to not murmur, to see the model in the Apostle Paul. He did not murmur. Look at verse 17 and 18. Quite a contrast. He says, yes, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering for the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Therefore, be glad and rejoice with me. Interesting, Paul's desire to be able to rejoice that he had not labored in vain for the Philippians is followed by a statement about his joy in the midst of suffering. Death was a real possibility for him. He was awaiting trial by Nero, could be beheaded. <laughs> was he murmuring? Was he complaining? No. You know what he says? If I'm poured out like a drink offering for y'all, that's the Oklahoma thing, for y'all. If I'm being poured out as a drink offering, I'm glad. I rejoice. In fact, when Paul says being poured out, you know, a drink offering was anytime they would offer a sacrifice in the Old Testament, sometimes they would pour wine or oil over it. The last thing they did, and it was to a uh, symbol of being offering their whole self. And that's what Paul's saying. I'm offering everything to the Lord, a complete sacrifice of devotion. I'm willingly yielding up my life for you. That's what he is saying. In fact, in Acts 20, where he's telling the elders goodbye at Ephesus, he says, none of these things move me, neither do I count my life dear to myself. My life's not important. I don't really care. Or when he tells Timothy, I'm being poured out as a drink offering, the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight, I finished the course, I kept the faith. That's what I have on my tombstone. If you wanna go visit my headstone, it's already there. Because when my husband passed away, they said, well, be good if you put what you want on there. I was like, why, I'm not dead yet. And they said, well, because it'll save your kids a lot of hassle. So I had already heard my husband about six months before the Lord took him from a sermon said, when I die, I want on my headstone, um, he taught his people to fear the Lord. And I thought, well, that's, I remembered that. I actually jotted it down. So I went and I'd always wanted on my headstone. She fought a good fight. She finished the course. She kept the faith. But I've told the ladies in my church, if I apostatized, go scratch it off. But I'm not planning, to, I'm not planning on doing that. But before salvation, my husband used to say he was going to put on my headstone. She did it her way. So <clears throat> he didn't get that chance because I got to do it first. But, but uh Anyway, so that's, that's what's on there now. But that was Paul's, that's what he said. He, he says that the Lord's already told me he's going to die. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. And you might say, well, you know, that's just for the apostles to be poured out. No, it's not. What does Paul say to the church at Rome? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, <laughs> holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. How do we do that? Don't be conformed to the world, to the world, but be transformed by renewing your mind. Ladies, it's the responsibility of all of us to be completely sold out to the Lord, whatever that it looks like in your life. We're all a living sacrifice. It didn't matter to Paul if he was going to die. It didn't matter. He says, I'm glad and I rejoice with you all. Paul's attitude was one of rejoicing in the midst of difficult circumstances, which is a far cry from complaining and arguing. And he wants them to be glad, to be joyful. Ladies, it's a wonderful thing to be able to rejoice with others, and it's a wonderful cure for murmuring and complaining, right? I know not too long after my husband passed away, I was... I'm, blessed to have two women that disciple me. One's 80, one's 90. They've been mentoring me for 37 years. One of them's lost two husbands and she was sitting next to me in church and I was having a difficult time. It's hard after 46 years when the pastor gets up and it's not your husband. And uh, so she kind of patted me on the leg and the next day we had lunch and she said, Susan, you've got to stop thinking about what you've lost and you've got to start thinking about what you have. I thought that was very wise. So from that day on, every day in my prayer journal, I write down at least four things I'm thankful for because I needed to change the way I was thinking, you know? I was kept, and yeah, we grieve, and I still miss my husband dearly, but I needed to change the way I think. Stop thinking about what I've lost and start thinking about what I have. 
That's what Paul is saying. Be glad. Rejoice with me. I'm going to go to go to glory, right? <laughs> and ladies, what a wonderful cure for murmuring and complaining. And ladies, just a reminder, the apostle Paul practiced what he preached. Do you know Paul spent 25% of his life in prison? And it was so bad. We'll talk about it maybe in the next session. It was so bad that most prisoners begged for a speedy death. A lot of them committed suicide. Very little water, very little food. Male and female pr prisoners incarcerated together. So there's a lot of sexual immorality going on. Very few toilets. I mean, they didn't have toilets in those days. Uh, so that, can you imagine the sickening stench of smelling all that? If you've ever been to a third world country, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I remember the first time I went to India to speak and I got off the line and go, what does that smell? And I realized what it was. And yet Paul says, I'm glad, I rejoice. I want you to be glad and rejoice with me. Well, as we wrap up, what is the command not to murmur? Don't do it. <laughs> Are you known for murmuring speech or merry speech? The motivation is not to murmur. We're to be blameless. We're to be harmless. We're to show the world we're children of God without fault. We're to shine as lights in the world. And also so our leadership will rejoice in the day of Christ. Does your speech reflect complaining or contentment? Will your leadership rejoice over you in the day he gives an account for you and especially for your speech? Murmuring and arguing is a dreadful, ugly sin, and it's one that I'm afraid we're all guilty of. And the opposite is what? Being thankful, praising God. There's a song that I grew up singing in a Baptist minister's home, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Do you know how that song was born? John and Charles Wesley were on their way home to England by ship after trying to evangelize some Indians in America. Their evangelism didn't go so well in America. But anyway, they were on the ship coming back, and they were on there with some missionaries. And they had such a spiritually refreshing time on that ship, more so than trying to evangelize the Indians in America. And after they came home, Charles Wesley, uh, it was 11 years later actually, composed a song based on what one of the missionaries had said to him on that ship. He said, oh, brother Wesley, the Lord has done so much for my life. Had I a thousand tongues, I would praise Jesus Christ with every one of them. Ladies, if you had a thousand tongues, would you praise Jesus Christ with every one of them? In closing, I want to give you some ways that you can use your tongue for thanksgiving instead of complaining. I actually pulled this from my mother's things 15 years ago when she passed away. She lived in Costa Mesa, but uh, I pulled this from her files. I wanna give you some thoughts. It's entitled, I am thankful for. I am thankful for the taxes I pay because it means I'm employed. I'm thankful for the clothes that fit a little too snug because it means I have enough to eat. I am thankful for a lawn that needs mowing, windows that need cleaning, and gutters that need fixing because it means I have a home. I am thankful for the spot I find at the far end of the parking lot because it means I'm capable of walking. I'm thankful for my huge heating bill because it means I'm warm. I'm thankful for all the complaining I hear about our government because it means we have freedom of speech. I'm thankful for the lady behind me in church who sings off key because it means I can hear. I'm thankful for the piles of laundry and ironing because it means my loved ones are nearby. I'm thankful for the alarm that goes off in the early morning hours because it means I'm alive. I'm thankful for the weariness and aching muscles at the end of the day because it means I've been productive. I'm thankful for that person or circumstance in my life that seems overwhelming right now because it means God is at work in my life conforming me to his image. Ladies, may our Lord help us to put off complaining, murmuring, arguing, 
and put on speech that is thankful because it's really what's in our heart. And that's where the issue is, right? In our hearts. Let's pray. Mm -hmm.